I am getting through it. We are getting there. Okay, said. <laughs> good, perfect. I'm glad you're there because I never get to test the sound, so that's good. Oh, 
Hello, everybody. So I have just a couple of announcements before we get the meeting started. Uh, I want to make sure you all knew that for those of you who are completing your 2000 level classes this semester, your BFA portfolios are due this Friday at 8, uh, 8 at 5 p.m. So you should know who you are. If you're finishing up those sophomore level classes uh, this semester, you need to turn in your BFA portfolio by 5 p.m. Second announcement. Next week, it will be virtual Prout, which means it's a Zoom presentation. So you can come here and sit in the pew with your, with your laptop if you really want to, but you probably won't. So, uh, so next week we have a really interesting uh, guest writer who will not be here in person, but will be using the, uh, the computer to uh, do some things that should be pretty cool. So Zoom next week with Bianca Stone, uh, and there will be books by her for purchase in the English department the following day. Uh, so. With that being said, I am going to welcome Megan Baraki up to introduce our first reader. So, Megan. Oh my God, this week the mic is like set up for smart people. Oh my gosh, I hear myself. Thank you. Sound people. Okay. So, tonight I'm introducing Maggie, and oh, what an honor it always is to do this. Um, I'll be honest, I almost threw up before I came here because I'm so nervous because I love her work so much. Um, so if I stumble, I'm sorry. It isn't every day that you find someone you connect with on such an intimate soul level, and it warms my life to have her in it. Maddie is a certified Appalachian badass, trinket lover, and plant parent. She's a very close friend of mine, a close confidant, but also one of the few people who I trust with their poetic intuition of my life. If she tells me I should change some something, you bet your ass I'm changing it. Some people may think she's quiet, but to that I just say, you're not trying hard enough. <laughs> Maddie writes about the knit and grit of the world and doesn't shy away from candid moments. She lets the reader in on tender and dark times between family, while also other times taking us to the sudsy duds, duds to listen in on a conversation. She doesn't use people in her work as like vehicles, but rather lets them live as walking testimonies to the people they are inspired by. A reminder that their lives happened, they exist and persist with or without our approval. 
Her poetry is so deeply moving and pulls at the heart and will have you wondering, what does the afterlife smell like? Matthew. so much. Um, my name is Maddie Radcliffe, and I have a few poems for everyone. Thank you to everyone for coming. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to read Angelica. She's extremely talented. It's an honor. Um, and happy first day of Libra season to all who celebrate. <laughs> um, so my poetry right now deals a lot with my traditions and my regional spiritual practices and the impact of place and people we love on every aspect. Um, of our lives. And in the chorus of S.G. Goodman's song, Space and Time, which is one of my favorite songs, there's a line that is, I never want to leave this world without saying I love you. And I want my poetry process to be a way of saying I love you to the people and places that inspire my work. Um, that being said, the first poem is for the women in my family, especially my grandmother. Good omens. When I told my grandmother I couldn't live through another spring, a flock of geese flew over her house and she cried. Women in our family read signs. They look for winter in a bird's breastbone, collect sidewalk coins as gifts from dead matriarchs, ask the grooves of creek rocks for reasons to keep living. I learned to press clover and wax paper. I listened for a great grandmother's footsteps when I'd never even heard her voice. When the geese flew over us, my grandmother told me the eastern sky meant new beginnings, and geese carry goodness on their feathers. I spend this life of springs watching birds become sunrise. The next one is the chariot, and the chariot is the seventh major arcana card in traditional tarot decks and represents willpower, spiritual journey, and ambition. Not only traditional tarot card, the artwork, um, like the chariot, one black sphinx and one white sphinx, and those represent opposing forces and the balance of those forces. The chariot. You are the rock, my mother says. She holds my hand in my father's room when she cries in hallways through the nurse's cafe. I become the girl who kisses her father's forehead when his own breath chokes him. When he outlines his poisoned kidney in the flat of his hand with sickness, eating him metal up, I don't turn away. My mother hides her face from me from hospital mirrors. I can only see myself as she says I should. The crescent, the white sphinx, I take her hurt. I tell my father before a surgeon splits his metal that I'll be beside him when he's being burnt shut. I navigate from one sadness to another while a stranger opens his body. I eat vended snacks with someone else's teeth, and I don't cry. When my mother screams, I hold reins with someone else's hands. <clears throat> um, this next poem was written because my mom tells me often that I will get married and have two daughters. And for a while, I just thought she was trying to curse me. Um, but <laughs> a few other people have told me that, so now I'm starting to worry a little bit. <laughs> On a crystal, my mother catches my future husband. He's tall, maybe, with enough understanding to collect how many teeth and seal first cut pearls and dollar pack envelopes. When I reach 24, my mother reveals where my lineage lives, walked away in her bedside chest. A great aunt's handsome linens, my grandmother's quilt, a collection of my baby clothes. Between handkerchiefs, she insists on two daughters. I've never asked for this family, but I see two witches collecting bugs and glass jars skipping through frost on every window. In dreams about planting roses in a dead woman's garden, their shy father. Our children, my mother claims, will become my legacy. I won't see these nightgowns or lace socks again until the first daughter is grown enough to wear them. I crawl through the chest keyhole before this gentle husband will know how a grandmother's lace could be sewn into wedding skirts. Four daughters can wear me, I rip apart every linen with tooth and thumb until his family is nothing but a premonition and I nothing but another daughter. This next poem is for the, all the people I love in my hometown, Greenfield, Ohio, between Sudsy Duds and Denver. 
A man and a woman I've never met slouch in the entrance to Sudsy Doves like teenagers piling up on the Presbyterian church steps. They toast with Mountain Dew cans from the unlit vending machine, their heated small talk competing with climbing washers. I've never been here, but it's every other place in town. Paint peeling off the ceiling in chunks, folding tables bubbling from years of wet laundry, half pieces of poo and piglet memos as out of order warnings. The man complains about his daily driver lawnmower being broke down again and how he fixed it up enough to haul his laundry down here. I know things of any kind here have a way of not working out. I've only ventured here because the machines elsewhere aren't working either. He babbles about John Deere blankets from a yard sale, yard sale still done up nice with plastic. He can't fit the son of a bitch in things in these washers. The woman goes on about how expensive it is to live and have nice things and how she's sick of her sister packing up and taking off to Colorado. When I leave, the man sips from his can while the woman tosses her arms up, says her bitch sister never picks up the phone. Hell, right now, she could be any place between here and Denver. The man twists his mustache and just listens because he doesn't have an answer for her, and neither do I. When I reach the parking lot, every spot is empty except for my car and the lawnmower. For a moment, I think of where the woman's sister could be. It's a big anywhere, I hope. Keeping a good house is generational. You will learn to clean a house two ways. Your grandpa taught your mother and she teaches you. First, with bleach and t-shirt rags and steel wool. Second, with sea salt and boiling water, fried mesh bags of rosemary and lavender, the slap of bells against an open hand. Your mom says there's a way of holding on to everything when someone grows up hard. Metal scraps, someone else's Sunday best, freezer candy, soap feet. You've seen the filth. You've met furniture heaped up like a front porch graveyard, short stacked living rooms with mildew bindings. When you hear the deep pain of bells and scattering of souls, do you tremble? Like those before you, you want to keep every sign of life. Bibles marked up like diaries, mangled leather boots, several pairs of pajamas. You can't. No more car part wastelands. No more souls weaving through new walls like long hair dried into knit sweaters. Instead, you salt and scrub, and you show others how a collection of knee socks and old brooms will swallow a new report stiff. Tell me, have you heard the clanging of plastic and metal or whispering from closets full of the dead man's clothes? Um, this poem is about an argument between my mom and grandma after my grandpa died, in which my mom told my grandma that my deceased grandfather doesn't care what sort of bridge we'd be having for the holiday. It's called First Bones. On the first day of January, everything feels exceptionally new. My mother and grandmother bicker about sugaring sauerkraut and peas. When he was alive, my grandfather ate ribs off the bone, and my grandmother made tradition cluttered on her kitchen tables like his gold rings and shopping lists. Grandpa, do these bones harbor our luck? In the stale kitchen air and rich heat of morning bread, my family is buried. My mom chatters on about baby New Year. I wonder if my grandfather collects jars of sauerkraut for a private celebration, or if watching the years advance in heaven hurts him just as much. Still, it is the first day of January. We eat the dead man's ribs. Um, the rest of these poems, I think, all follow this theme, but I'm really interested in the difference between our physical bodies and our souls and how, in my mind, they're separate and how that impacts my view and experiences with death, and I'm hoping to finish a few similar to this one when I started with my grandfather. It's the body of grandpa. Some people die twice, so I watched my grandfather die both times. Like notebook fringe, he crumbled between hospital bed sheets. Each morning, an under search for breath, a pulse of oxygen across his mouth. I imagine him as a fearless child, swimming in the Ohio River, his head sinking far below the surface. So far, even, that he can't tell if his eyes are opened or closed, if his breath is off current. When he died the second time, on an August weekday, I looked everywhere for his spirit. 
I begged for some glimmer of him in driveway pennies, his laughs slipping through cracks in kitchen windows. At his funeral, nowhere. God, could you tell me if it hurts when the soul leaves after the body, or if it's nothing but dark? I think I live on the line between river and island. How to find heaven. Imagine your sick father is milkweed. Before October turns cold, hold it to your ear. The wind will curse you as it carries the silk east. Your grandfather will die and you will build a treasure map of everything in his jean pockets. Chapstick, a half two, a fistful of keys, six folded Benny Franklin's is hay money. When your frightened brother cries for you, ask him what the afterlife smells like. To the good men you know, heaven is lines of wooden bird feeders forever full. At the end of a map, the fields grow with plenty of grass, just small enough to mow. You will return to every simple thing you've loved, like those broken legged baby birds, worms severed for fishing trips, pressed flowers from your grandfather's garden, your untidy pastures, chase your ancestor's soul across ditches, like with mystery snails, over mountains of horse shit and dirt until the bones of livestock become star matter. Follow the floss of milkweed and kiss its forehead. Eat soil where few good men left blueprints, and let the soft of you give in. June. Every afternoon, my father and I examine the dark foliage for new summer growth. We find wild petunias stunted by an oak tree shade. Full mulberries, my great grandmother's beloved fruit, bend a young tree's branches. At the edge of the pond, sunfish hatchlings braid themselves into new colony, fast covering just below them. Watch, my father insists, the bass are patient. While they wait for us one misstep. My father coughs, a handful of fresh blood. I watch his shoulders shake as sunfish race below clumps of algae, the thick green sludge and cattails unwavering. Under the shadow of the hemlock, the summer air smothers me. Um, this next poem is again about life and death, and I think about it all the time. Uh, I kind of get stuck in thinking about the number of times that our souls, our essence, has experienced life and death. And I usually get caught up in thinking about where all the people I love have been and where they'll be going. Um, and the next poem is for my brother, who is one of the kindest and also strangest people I have ever met. And this is one of the moments I try to figure out where he's going and also where he's been. Anthus's Resurrection for Mason. One. In one lifetime, my brother rose from the mountain. Nothing but soil and moss, sparrow strengthened him. Quills for eyelashes, bits of beef for toes. To repay them, he spent a spring weaving nests from oak twigs, dried violets, dead metal. They gave him the warbler's voice box, and he made bird song that turned leaves inward. When he returned to the mountain head first, his sparrows knitted pawpaw leaves through the dirt as if it were the skin on his back. Two. He returned on a June morning, a Tuesday, this time cut from her mother. The back of his neck glowed violently. When she saw him, she told me birthmarks reveal how he died in another life. When he was eight, my brother learned to call birds with nothing but his voice. He led ducks to the river. He read turkey fans like rooms. On a hunting trip, a jar of nut hatches rested on his shoulders. Three. Last August, my brother shook pawpaws off their branches, cutting away purple wounds where birds had torn the fruit. A shirt basket full, he told me that flies fall near the trees, and pawpaws produce the largest fruit when something dies at their roots. His birthmark had thinned and darkened, like a thumb had been pressed there, just hard enough to bruise. When we cut the fruit open, he left skins for the sparrow to turn. Their next spring nest fat with gray eggs, the goodness of our rod. This next poem is about Jesus and me, and wherever I'll be going when I'm done here. When I dream of resurrection, I imagine myself with Jesus in an orchard, and we've been there before. Belly sick under a date palm, we pick pulp from pit, 
our feet flat on the earth. I want to ask him where we'll go when we die again. Instead, he'll hold the center of days in his palm. Seeds can last hundreds of years, he'll say, thousands even. But watch how quickly the skin falls, Jesus and me. I'll think to ask him how the sun shines differently here, how the palm's fronds bend to it, where the soul stays when we destroy the body. There is nothing now but here, he'll say, nothing but the memory of that sugared egg, the solid stone. In this lifetime, the pit, the next, flesh, and all of them, the sweetness. My brother's dendrology. On one of our evening walks, my brother introduces our backyard trees, a cottonwood with star branches, a young mulberry, a dozen wild fruit trees being digested by black balls. It always starts the same way, fungus sent through split branches, the swallowing of knots. He explains all illness that way, that any death can clot a being until it bursts, and any dying body we encounter is another we've experienced before. Every yellowed autumn leaf and obituary, our father of each cherry tree. And this is my last poem. How to return after your own death. In the moment the Scioto cracks open into the Ohio, gather with the ancestors once born into anger. Light a white candle, your name is carved into its side. You will rinse your own ribs and rivers thick with filth, and the night will eat each of you. You feel the clay squeezing your toes like hands and you stomp your grief into the bank. The water will carry you south after someone demolishes the river stilts and oak trees you use to find your family's graves. In a valley of tooth wart, follow your own scent to the plot marked only by clover. Under it, your front teeth will peek through the dirt. Fuck them until spring buds and incisors split from the same stem. Blow out the candle. Thank you. experience with that, right? Oh, just breathe. That was intense. Thank you. One more time for Maddie. Oh, I love it. Woo All right, now it's about to get even just as brilliant. <laughs> if I could say that diplomatically, because Angelica is brilliant. I'm about to bring up Angelica. I'm really excited to hear her work as always. And I'm really honored to, I'm tall as time. <laughs> You're right, it's just casual. Um, so Angelica's writing is both defiant and inward, draws the reader into the very personal to criticize the public. Her work looks racism unflinchingly in the face forces it to see its ugly self contend with the mess that it's made. She's an artist who uses a crisis to marry the creative process with the creator. She uses poetry to challenge oppression and explore cultural identity in an unexpected place. She uses memoir to build an archive for things that need to be not just remembered, but imagined in the first place. She creates moments of tender incandescence with heartbreaking simplicity. A breakthrough mandala drawing class over Zoom, an unspoken bond over a stolen cigarette, a carefully placed shrine to the dead. We like to say that she's the program's next Anthony Doerr, to which Angelica will be like, oh, Tony Doerr wishes. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> but she's not kidding, and, uh, and neither are we. Both she and her work are funny without trying to be, and angry without trying to be. She's tired of your bullshit, and she's going to drag you gently 
to a higher state of being. <laughs> Her work unsnares you and unsettles you, refuses to put up a fair fight with an unfair world. Sometimes she'll take refuge from the exhausting pain, but she'll only do it in plain sight so you can feel it too. So I'm proud to have Angelica as uh, my inspiration, my mentor, uh, my um, critique partner, my cohort, and my friend. I am a better writer and thinker and human because of her. I might be a robot, but that's just me. Um, <laughs> someday, when we're both famous, I will build her a giant house filled to the top with squishmallows <laughs> and magic mushrooms and Medina breakfast cookies strung with fruit whips and piped with perpetual Mariah Carey music where nobody is ever cruel when the war is over, when we've won. Angelica won the Zocalo Poetry Prize in 2021. She has pieces coming out in Poet Lore, Muchacha Fanzine, and Frontier Poetry. Please welcome to the stage, Angelica Esquivel. leaves a visual zest. It doesn't matter that it's a Monday morning. The neighbor kid finds time before school to dribble his basketball in the driveway. His golden lab, Lucy, finds time to sneak into the garden to dig. And the northern cardinals have nothing but time to chatter and dive among the trees that line the church parking lot across the street. I want to wake well-rested here, lean into the common light. I want to tie myself cotton candy pink and lullaby blue ribbon into the deep ecology of a sailor moon metamorphosis, to ease into now as it carries on like a cloud, composing itself cutely and carefully before falling and falling apart. Citadel Dawn. Hidden germination. The water and sky were born before the land, and this is how it happened. This is how it is. They say the words came before an abundance of blooming hearts. The adobe clay on your fingers leave smudges on the edge of the page, and these blurry fingerprints become our home. Holy fungus mushrooming inside what must, for the sake of simplicity, be called a mine. Mine is slightly woozy as it is volleyed over mountains and hidden in the hollow of a willow. We waterfall, weeping and weeping, no matter the feeling.
And this poem is for my roommate, Kelly. <laughs> um, the delight of the incoherence. It made sense to me. How I carry you and not you, and carry me and not me. How I knot me into a knobby balloon twisted fetal and imagine I'm on one side. We were never born, a fellow C-section baby tells me. We were cut out of our mothers. She laughs because it's sci-fi body horror, and we love sci-fi body horror, because our limbs and stars and struggles are sci-fi body horror. A despot follows and unfollows us on Twitter. We play hide and seek in a park built over a dump, built over paradise on a school night when I'm selectively mute and tracing my life across a sacred river of trash. My fellow C-section baby loves rivers, especially those subterranean ones that hide like feathered serpents, slickened by oil and water and waste. We once worshipped every creature, and everything was creature. We were once worthy of worship ourselves. <coughs> okay, so now slightly shifting gears into fiction. Um, I'm going to read a piece of my novel. So this excerpt is closer to the end of the book. Um, it's mostly autobiographical, kind of like stream of consciousness fragmentation going on. Um, and there's a kind of dialogue that was not really intentional, but there's a kind of a dialogue happening between this and the poems that I just read. So, I don't know, maybe you'll enjoy that. <laughs> okay, so the working title I have for this is Non-Self-Portrait. Are you Indian? A security officer asks me as she waves me through a scanner inside the Cochin International Airport in southern India, the first fully powered, solar-powered airport in the world. The officer's black hair is slicked back into a tight bun. She doesn't smile as she questions me, but she also doesn't seem unkind. No, I'm Mexican, I reply. But you're wearing Indian clothes, she says, with her brow slightly raised. I see Jonah exit his line and come over to wait for me at the end of mine. My husband is Indian. Is it a love marriage? Yes. She nods and waves me through. Ten people are killed by a white supremacist in a grocery store the day Jonah and I return from India. Our plane lands and my stomach gets hot. My therapist during college tells me that racism is a two-way street. She adopts two children from South America and keeps a photo of them on her desk. I tell her that I have a hard time trusting people, that I'm having a hard time trusting her right now. Our Uber driver on the way home from the airport is from Ukraine. He has yellow and blue flags mounted on the dashboard and a sign on the back of the passenger seat explaining how his people and country are currently under attack by Russia. My mother tells me not to go to a protest because the cops will track me through my phone and put me on a watch list. Isn't that all the more reason to go, I say? Doesn't it bother you that the state has that kind of power? Yes, it does, but there's nothing we can do about it. Protesting isn't going to change anything. Uh, protesting has resulted in a great deal of change throughout history, so I disagree with you. <laughs> I'm a scary cat growing up, seeing monsters in the closet and screaming if my sisters even ride their bicycles too close to mine. But I'm not so afraid anymore. I suppose I have a belief system that brings me some kind of solace. If I die, I'll just reincarnate and get right back on my bullshit. <laughs> okay. All my ancestors ended up dying and they turned out fine. <laughs> I tried to wrap my head around it in the morning. What could drive someone to murder complete strangers? What could drive someone to wake up one day on this beautiful earth with the light shining through the trees and the clouds drifting to the, through the sky and think, I need to drive into an area where a lot of black people live so I can kill as many of them as possible? I realize that for some people, colonization is literally synonymous with life. Kill or be killed conquer or be conquered. I don't leave home for weeks, partly because I'm decompressing after a long trip, but also because I'm terrified of going into public places and depressed as hell. Everything I touch is Mexican, a notion that is oddly comforting. This is my Mexican home, my Mexican couch, my Mexican food, Mexican dog, Mexican shower, Mexican coffee mug, Mexican dirt. In my astronomy textbook, Life in the Universe, it says that even if we somehow make it to another solar system and manage to colonize its planets, eventually we will run out of places to go. When I'm a kid, after my parents' divorce, we usually go grocery shopping at night, since the rest of the time our dad is working. He gives us money and sleeps in the car while my sisters and I roam the store, seeing what other kind of folks are shopping at a Walmart in rural Ohio at 2 in the morning. 
Now I'm thinking that I might start doing all my grocery shopping in the middle of the night once more, since I'm less likely to encounter some maniac with a gun. Is this an overreaction? If you give a mouse a cookie, but with people and guns. If you give a mouse a cookie, they're going to want a glass of milk. If you give a person a gun, they're going to want to use it. I sit outside and draw a picture of our deck. The white railing, scarlet and orange umbrella, potted palm. But I keep accidentally pressing too hard with my acrylic paint markers and paint splatters across the page. A blob of brown, a blob of orange like a warning. I smudge them around with my fingers until they're muddy and then give up. Let the puddles of paint dry while I go play tug of war with Rocky, our pandemic pup. My grandparents, Ama and Aba, and my Aunt Irma visit to see our new house. They pull into the driveway in their big white van and disembark. I spot Aba's white mustache and the trucker cap covering his receding hairline. He always has a, has a playful smile like he just played a prank on someone. He doesn't know much English, and I don't know much Spanish, so we mostly communicate through hugs and food. Ama is short and has a long silver braid. She speaks lots of English, though sometimes pretends she can't when she doesn't feel like talking, which is never. <laughs> Two of her sisters, I think that makes them my great aunts, died in the past year. I don't know how she carries their memory so effortlessly. I know it probably isn't effortless at all. Aunt Irma is in her 50s now, though she's always been youthful. She has hair that is like a moss, but still shot through with some black. Ama once told me that when Aunt Irma was an infant, she got very sick with the fever, suffered complications, and has dealt with various health issues since. We can meet in the dining room and eat a melange of Indian and Mexican food, two cuisines that go particularly well together, in my opinion, just like Jonah and me. Are these beans vegetarian, Ama? I ask. I hold up a spoonful and squint at it. Yes. I take a bite. There's chorizo in here. Just a little, she replies. <laughs> After dinner, we sit in the living room and talk. This couch is nice, Anna says. I want to meet my grandbabies before I die. She says, this, <laughs> she says this with a twinkle in her eye, but she really means it. I don't know if I want to have kids. I want grandbabies. All my big family makes me happy. Well, there's a world to deal with, and I'm nervous about dying in childbirth, I say. But I don't want to disappoint her, so I add, maybe we'll adopt. I keep finding ladybug carcasses on the inside of the windowsill. I wonder if this windowsill is their version of a retirement home. They're Florida, and they come here to die, or if they just happen to get trapped inside and can't make it back out. I know a lot of people find ladybugs cute, but I'm terrified of them to the point that I used to have nightmares about them as a kid. How can I find the interbeing in creatures that disgust me, like centipedes and millipedes? A man goes on a shooting spree in an elementary school in Texas. So many beautiful children are killed. I can't stop thinking and hoping that they died instantly, even as I know that some of them lay there bleeding out while the police wait in the hallway. They must be so afraid. Jonah starts smoking again. He says it's just a stress thing because we traveled a lot recently. Says he'll quit again by the end of the week. I'm retreating to my art studio to paint the lush green hills of Kochi. Jonah's ancestral home. Rubber trees wrapped with cloth, ripe for tapping. Dozing bulls with cranes perched nearby. The deepest greens I've ever seen. Blankets of soft fog, crows, lizards, winding roads. Pedestrians, tuk-tuks, delivery trucks piled high with jackfruit. The honking, the motorbikes. Mosquitoes, chapels, churches, mosques, and temples. Stores where they sell nuts, dates, and candy. Women with their scarves blowing in the warm breeze what appears to be a look of amused confusion worn into a palm tree's trunk. During the painting break, I wipe my hands on an old t-shirt and eat an orange. The seeds inside of it seem like little specks of wood. I understand the desire to crush sweetness, not because it is sweet, but because it is false. While I mix about 30 different shades of green paint and paper cups on my desk, I watch YouTube videos of the art portfolios of students accepted to the Rhode Island School of Design the most prestigious art school in the country. This woman holds up a painting of hers that has to be my favorite. A family of cows sitting around a table eating some human burgers. Surprisingly, the humans do not look pleased. <laughs> I sit at the kitchen table and cry for the dead children, for their families, for the unfathomable. I cry for those who cannot accept reality and so say it never happened. 
some small, practically meaningless in the grand scheme of things good news. I received an email telling me I want a spot at, at an artist residency taking place next month in Northern Michigan. Feeling two ways, grateful because no one in my family has ever had the luxury of doing something so frivolous as what is essentially a week of socializing and drinking with other artists, but also stressed out because I need to create something to move the culture forward in a meaningful way. But what does that even mean? At the hardware store with Jonah. At the intersection of two aisles, an old white man walks oddly close to us, then jumps back, furrowing his brow as we pass. I furrow my brow back in. It feels inevitable. Men and boys with guns draw closer each day, and I think this reality must be a test or a punishment. There is one week of school left before my niece Fawn and little sister Alia are on summer break. I pray all the children make it through. Living in a country rife with gun violence really makes news from other places seem dull. A car drives into a crowd, killing one. A man stabs two people. One or two deaths is mundane in the face of massacre after massacre. I don't want to become desensitized to violence, but it seems like that's my only choice besides going mad with grief and anxiety. I can hardly get out of bed in the morning, but I force myself to make the most of my day for those who cannot. English breakfast tea with oat milk and cookies. I peel a hydrocolloidal acne patch off my face to find a, a pale rectangle in its place, like I went tanning while wearing it, even though all I did was sleep. No matter what I do to try to look better, it only ends up making me look worse, so I've decided to, to just stop trying. What I want most is a good hunger, for it to move me on its own. Survival seems to be a matter of compartmentalization, making my, myself temporarily forget the evils of humanity long enough to function. Unfortunately, I'm not so good at forgetting. In fact, most days, it seems that all I do is remember. Meditating on death. Not in a suicidal way, but because I want to be prepared. I lie down on our bedroom floor and imagine shooting my consciousness out of the top of my head. After a few minutes of this, I doze off. When I was little, I would wake up before dawn and watch Sailor Moon while my father got ready for work. I didn't like to eat much besides raw vegetables and ranch dressing, which I would arrange into an enchanted forest on my plate. Broccoli florets became trees, baby carrots became logs, ranch dressing became a pond. I Google Sailor Moon and the first thing that comes up is, is Sailor Moon a white girl? Which I click on because it's a good question actually, one I've never considered. The answer in this article says that Sailor Moon is raceless since she's an alien, which seems like a cop out to me, but whatever. <laughs> Down the Wikipedia rabbit hole and learning about lunar pareidolia. Pareidolia are the meaningful images we tend to find within random patterns, such as the faces we see in power outlets. Lunar pareidolia have to do with what we see when we look at the moon, like the man on the moon associated with Western cultures. It's interesting, both Asian cultures and cultures indigenous to the Americas have folklore about a rabbit on the moon. In the ancient Buddhist Jatakas, the tale goes like this. Several animals believe that if they are especially generous on the day of the full moon, they will also be especially rewarded. An old man asks the animals for some food. The jackal offers a lizard, a monkey offers fruit, the rabbit, who is unable to collect anything besides grass, offers its own body. The old man reveals himself to be Sakra, king of one of the highest heavens. Moved by the rabbit's offering, Sakra places the image of the rabbit on the moon so everyone will know of its virtue. In Aztec mythology, the god Quetzalcoatl is living on the earth as a human. He is walking a long distance and eventually becomes tired and hungry but has nothing to eat. A nearby rabbit offers itself up as food, but instead of eating it, Quetzalcoatl lifts it up to the heavens, placing its image on the moon for all to see, and then lowers it back down again. I learned that the protagonist of Sailor Moon, Usagi, is named after the moon rabbit. I wonder if the shared rabbit on the moon mythology supports the theory that the first people on Turtle Island arrived via the Bering Land Bridge. I wonder if this says something about what our cultures find important, or what we find unimportant. At night, I stare at the moon, trying to see the shape of a rabbit in the shadows in Maria, but I can't find it. A mom calls to tell me, a mom calls to tell me that my dad started drinking again. You didn't know, she asks. I kind of guessed, since she's been sharing a lot of classic rock videos on Facebook. 
Athad took your daddy to the gas station to buy a six pack. He paid with a hundred dollar bill and told the cashier, keep the change. He's very generous when drunk, I laugh. I wish you would give me some money. Me too. Low on money, low on weed, trying to create something, but having a hard time focusing. I want to know how my dad's doing, but calling around and asking people to check on him feels like giving in to his antics. It seems that he wants us to worry about him drinking himself to death or dying in a fiery drunken car wreck. I try to do research, go to therapy, and work to have compassion. He began drinking when he was just a child. His frontal lobe is formed around the glass bottle. He didn't have access to the tools and information we have access to. It's because of colonialism, capitalism, machismo. But at a certain point, my empathy just ends. At a certain point, I must prioritize myself. Should I call him? I asked Jonah. He'll be all emotional, Jonah says. So I shouldn't call him. He sighs. No, you should, just to make sure he's OK. My sisters and I discuss it during our weekly family therapy. We have a Zoom meeting with Sheila, a Buddhist teacher who lives in California. She has bright pink hair and full sleeves of dark blue ink tattoos. Has anyone talked to dad, Juana asks. I called him yesterday, but he didn't answer, so he's probably dead, I say. We all laugh, not at the thought of him being dead, but at my dramatic pause. Sorry, I say to Sheila, we have a dark sense of humor. Some people find it off-putting. I think that's a perfectly healthy coping mechanism, Sheila says. To love an addict, one must have a sense of humor. To love an addict, one must accept that their position in this world is slightly more precarious than the rest of ours. To love an addict, one must mourn them before they've even died in an effort to shield ourselves from the shock that won't be any less shocking, though we saw it coming. My sisters who share an apartment bring up a disagreement they have this week. Bianca has the restroom reserved from 10 to 11 every morning so she can get ready for work, but today Juana needs to use it during this time frame. Bianca refuses, which makes Juana mad, so Juana calls me and asks if she can come over to my place to use the bathroom, which I reluctantly agree to because it's a strange request. The little things can cause upset more easily when you're already dealing with a major stressor, as you all are, Sheila says. Let's meet on Sunday so I can provide you with some extra support. I'm giving you some homework this week. Ask yourselves these questions. One, what do I want? Two, what do I need? Three, how am I getting my needs met? Four, is it by the right person? Five, am I confusing my wants and my needs? Six, who would I be without the resentment? One, I want to know that my loved ones are safe and healthy and happy. I want to hang out and do arts and crafts and live an easy life. I want us to not feel compelled to drink just because it's summer. I want to smoke a cigarette. I want my jaw to stop hurting. Two, I need to keep myself busy so I don't fall into a depression and sleep all day. I need to turn to healthy coping mechanisms instead of using my stress as an excuse to fall back into bad habits. Three, I'm getting my needs met by taking to myself to Calgary. Also through talking, writing, and making art. So I'm not avoiding what's stressing me out, but I'm also not ruminating on it in a way that upsets me. Four, I think so. Five, probably six, question marks. After therapy, I meet up with my sisters at the swimming pool in their apartment complex. I eat a palm full of magic mushrooms and doodle in my sketchbook. Lana is blowing bubbles over the water. Bubbles, water, glass, and the shiny parts of eyes are all things I still struggle to draw or paint, even after years of art education. A plane flies overhead and Lana waves her hands at the sky and shouts, the war is over. I draw the pool as if it's in a dream. Big lily pads float on top of water that's murky with algae and milk. Next to the pool, there is a stone temple shaped like a face. The diving board is a long tongue. A beautiful, ageless, immortal mermaid lives in the pool, and she is like God in that I cannot determine if she is good or evil. Juana's friend Abe is at the pool with us. He just finished undergrad and wants me to give him some advice on what to do next, but I don't know what to say. It's not like I have my own shit together exactly. I tell him to take a break and take it easy on himself. I don't really feel like talking. White fluff from the cottonwood trees floats through the air like summer snow and sticks to the wet cement around the pool. Worries, those that are mine and those belonging to others, take up a lot of space. 
How can I affirm to someone else that we are beautiful, we are good, we are on the right path when I can hardly believe it myself? I need to nurture my grief, sing into it. It is nice to sit here quietly. Thank Zoom next week, don't forget, uh, and I'll see you back here in two. Oh, my God. 
Goodbye, everybody. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.